Hey everyone, it's the host of All Across America, Marco Vig, jumping in for a few seconds before the show to thank you all for listening, to let you know that I want to hear from you. Tell me what you like about the show, and send me your suggestions too. Follow us on Instagram, at AllXAmerica, or visit the website, allacrossamerica.net, and you can use our contact page there. If you want to support us, we're on Patreon, at patreon.com slash allacrossamerica. Try to respond personally to everyone who reaches out, so say hello. All right, on with the show. Podcasting from Portland East to Portland West, from Big Pine Key to Pacific Beach, and from San Juan to Guam. This is All Across America. Well, uh, I'll jump into it. Kevin is a hypnotist and star of the longest running uh, hypnotist show in Las Vegas, Hypnosis Unleashed. He's also the author of Deep Into My Eyes, From Victim to Vegas Headliner. And as I was saying before the show, um, not only is it a memoir of his career, but it's really a must-read how-to guide for any aspiring stage performer. So, Kevin, it's an honor to have you. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on, Mark. It's my pleasure. Well, I wanted to bring it all back home and, and start with your hometown of Detroit and just uh, yep. tell us how you got started as a stage performer. So I grew up in the Detroit area. Um, I actually used to live downtown Detroit at one point. Um, I just couldn't take the winters anymore, so I love Las Vegas. Yeah. But I started by doing plays in high school, and then I got picked up by an entertainment company when I was 16 years old. So I was Barney for your little brother's birthday. Uh, actually, for legal reasons, I was a purple dinosaur at your little brother's birthday. You know, we had the purple dinosaur. We had the karate turtles. We right, had, the Aquaman Ninja yeah, Turtles. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, but I mean, honestly, it I made as much in one show as I did uh, as I made in a week for flipping pizzas. And I'm like, well, I've got a new career. But, you know, doing the costume character stuff, uh, they needed people who could do clown work. So I learned to do clowning. I learned to do balloons. I uh, learned a few magic tricks that got me into doing magic and the magic kind of took off for me for a number of years. And that led to a lot of opportunities until I was about 20 when I started working with some hypnotists. They helped me get enrolled in the course for social workers. And then the hypnosis show just slowly built and built and built until it took off. Wow. As, uh, as, as most people will tell you in almost any career, it only takes about 10 years to become an overnight success. Only, right. <laughs> 10 years, 10,000 hours. <laughs> yep. Um, and, and I noticed in the book, and I, you've overcome a lot of things. Uh, you, you know, you had contemplated suicide at one point. Yes. You had a significant stutter. And yep. you're a stage performer. And, 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 you know, maybe you could talk about that. Um, and I noticed there was, a, there was a definite shift in your life when you turned around 15. There was. Uh, I was severely bullied as a kid. Um, I was severely bullied and abused by uh, some of the adults who were supposed to protect me. Thankfully, my home life, my, my mom and dad were there for me. They just didn't really realize the extent of everything that was going on. And that led to me having a huge stuttering problem. I could not do interpersonal communication. I was so afraid, so angry, and so scared that my brain was moving much faster than my mouth could. And I felt like I had to get every word out right now or I wouldn't be heard. But that wasn't true when I was on stage. Um, when, when I was asked to speak for class, when I was asked to recite, I was in my comfort zone. The abuse, the bullying led me to a moment when I was about 15 where I was ready to take my own life. And thank God I came up with a different plan. And that plan was... You know, I, I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed a weird, different kind of prayer where what I was saying was, you know, God, I, I can't keep going like this. You know, I, I made this list of everything I liked about myself, which was a very short list at that point. I made a list of everything I wish I could have been and a list of things I didn't like about myself. And that list was really long. And I'm like, I want to be this person. And I put in the work. And I saw that if I tried, maybe I could do this. And then I started at a new school and I made some friends for the first time in my life. I really put myself out there. I tried to make friends and I tried to make friends by listening. And that opened up a lot more. And what I have to give a lot of credit to, to a group of 15-year-old high school misfits and punks, because that was the clique that 
embraced me was for about four months. They let me do this. When I was talking, they let me meter my words. And for, for those listening and you're tapping. Yep. Your I, yep. I, I would tap. I would tap a desk. I would tap my leg. I would tap my arm. They allowed me that metronome. I mean, the, we're talking the, the 90s. The term safe space didn't exist. Right. So before that was even a concept, this group of friends gave me the space, the room to develop my voice. And within four or five months, the stutter was gone. And so, um, you know, and I noticed from reading the book, I don't know if it's conscious or unconscious, you switch at 15 from the third person, Kevin did this, Kevin did that, to the first person, I did this and I did that. It's It was very conscious because when I look back at those that period of my life, it's really hard for me to put myself back into that person's shoes. You know, it's it's, I remember it. I remember the the mental, emotional, and physical exhaustion and pain. But at this point, it's almost like it happened to someone else. Like it happened to somebody that I cared about, that I care about very, very deeply. But not somebody that I feel like anymore. So it was easier almost that. And when you're talking about traumas like that, sometimes it's really, really easier to pull back from that trauma and disassociate so that you can look at it with the view of a spectator instead of the um, instead of feeling the emotional underwaterness of being the like the victim in that scenario yeah yeah i think that's i hadn't hadn't thought of it that way it makes makes a lot of sense and uh, so 15 and you know you wrote this list about yourself that did at that point mm -hmm. you decide you wanted to be a stage performer or you had active in some plays at that point or was it not so you got involved with all all i really decided at that point was i wanted to be a person who had friends and who was sincere and who could really talk with people that Everything else that happened next, everything that happened with being able to grow and being able to really launch myself in that was because I found joy on the stage. When I stepped out on the stage, it just it brought me happiness. And every time I leaned into it, that happiness just grew and grew. And I mean, you've done almost everything as a stage performer <laughs> you've you've been a fire eater magic improv plays uh comedy what 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 drew you finally to to hypnosis above all things you know at first it was just the chance to learn something new but then especially so i moved from detroit down to new orleans so that a six-month contract and six months turned into five years because i met a group of people who really helped me and they asked me, they're like, so you're doing hypnosis, but what do you really want to do on stage? And I said, I want to make people, I want to turn my volunteers into stars. I want them to feel great for being up there. And they all went, ooh, now that's interesting. And they really helped me write a show that said, that says, I have something really fun and interesting to share with you. And if you walk up on my stage, I'm going to make you look like a star and you're going to feel great. And as soon as that became the whole point of the show, the show grew and grew and grew and grew. And uh, you wrote uh, that you wanted your, your um, audience to be um, uplifted, not humiliated. Yes. Yep. Yeah, it's, and, and that's one of the hallmarks of a great performer is, you know, I can name a lot of comics who are in like that Don Rickles, you know, poke fun at people. Right. But the experts at that, Don Rickles also made you feel loved when he was doing it. You know, he it's there is this weird moment for for comics who do that type of material. There's a very, very hard moment where they have to realize and come up with how do I make everybody feel good for feeling this? 
So bring us um, bring us down to New Orleans. You were there what in two thousand one? I I I lived in New Orleans. I left about two thousand. So, but during this you know the same time period, you know pre Katrina. Yep. So I've got the weirdest bookends. Um, I moved to New Orleans right after nine eleven, and Katrina kicked me out. <laughs> Which, you know, I mean, that it's a very, very, very weird bookend to have. Yeah. Uh, but New Orleans was fantastic. I often say that the five years I lived in New Orleans were 10 of the craziest years of my life. <laughs> There's really no better way to explain it. Uh, I, you know, I, if, it's funny. I just took my wife back there for Christmas last year because I wanted to hang out with my my goddaughters, my nieces and my best friend. And I love it down there. It's not my New Orleans anymore because me and my group of idiots have all kind of grown and gone our separate ways. But what I love is I can look back in all the places me and my idiots all hung out and there's a whole new group of idiots doing <laughs> the exact same things we were doing. And a hundred years from now, there still will be. And that's really comforting. Yeah, exactly. hundred <laughs> percent. I feel like, you know, my, my, my group of idiots are in Chicago and Honolulu and, you know, I'm in the New York area, but yeah, they're another group doing the exact same thing. Exactly. <laughs> and there's, there's a beauty of knowing that that spirit of New Orleans. And one of the cool things about New Orleans is whatever you want it to be. There's the party, there's the writers, there's the artists, there's the musicians, there's the bankers, there's the lawyers, there's the, whatever community you want, it was there and it was all within like two miles. Pretty so much. it's, it's, there's something beautiful to know that that spirit is still there and always will be. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. What, and so Post post Katrina, did did you move to Vegas right then and there? Or? No. So after I got very lucky. Ah, I, I cannot stress how lucky I was. And I say that because I never took hurricane threats seriously. Had I not been on the road and in Detroit uh doing a bunch of gigs, I probably would have been down there. So I'm very thankful to God for that one. Um, but I, I ended up moving back to Detroit. And then I moved back there on my 30th birthday. And my 30th birthday present to myself was when I decided to find my birth parents. I'm adopted. And so that, I mean, I went from being the oldest of three to the oldest of 10. And then ended up, you know, doing a whole bunch of corporate work that took me all around the world. So I lived in Detroit from 30 to 35. And when I was 35, I had the opportunity to move to Vegas for about six months and now six months is going on 14 years and I've been running, you know, the hypnosis show for 13 and a half and growing. Wow. And it's, it's been amazing. Hypnosis Unleashed has, has been growing and growing. We're at the four Queens and they have been great partners to us. It has been fantastic. So, so tell us like the experience in, in finding a room. You were at Binion's, you were at Hooters for a while. So when I first started, Hypnosis Unleashed was run by Michael Johnson, Terry Stokes, and I got to meet them and I got to do little things in their show. And I, I, so I had at this point when I moved to New Orleans, I had over 15 years of experience worldwide doing shows, but I didn't know anything about Vegas. I didn't try and pretend like I did. I basically became an intern for these guys. For six months, I learned. And I asked questions and I learned. And I would have thought every hypnotist would have been like that, that you would want to learn from people who are doing what you wanted to be doing. Unfortunately, I found out, and, and this is true in almost all fields, is the people who should be learning from mentors are too busy trying to impress mentors with what they know. They want to talk when they should be listening. And it was that ability to listen and learn that eventually they gave me one night a week. And then one of the guys retired. So then I went to three nights a week. And then the theater we were in was closing down. And uh, Michael Johns was kind enough to offer to let me carry the name forward, which helped me with all the ticket brokers and kept the show going. You know, it, it started in around 2000. So it's got, you know, 24 years of a, of history behind it now. And I've been running it for 
over 13 and it's just inch by inch. You know, it's finding the room in Vegas is the hard part. It really is. And it's called show business. And you really have to look at the business side of it. When you look at the business side of it and you get that meeting with the people who can make the decision as to whether or not they want to bring you in, when you can do it as business, you're going to be way more successful. You told the story of an agent, I think it was back in Detroit, who you had sent a marketing package early on, and then it took three years for you to get yes. a meeting with them. And I, they said, uh, tell us the story if you could. Okay, so uh, in Deep Into My Eyes, and if you want a copy of the book, you can go to deepintomyeyes.com. But I, I talk about this moment because I met an agent when I was about 18, 17, 18, very, very high-powered agency at the time in Detroit. And he was impressed with what I did, and he requested my promo material, and then he didn't book me for almost three years. And at the end of that three years, when we started working together finally, I asked him why. Why did it take three years? And he brought me into the office, and he showed me. For the last three years, I'd been sending him promo. And he said, I want you to pretend these aren't 10 promo packets you sent me. Pretend these are 10 people. Which of these 10 people would you hire? And I'm like, well, my most recent promo kid. He said, right, because that looks professional. I knew you had the talent, but until you had the ability to show me you were a pro, I couldn't book you. So how did you approve your marketing? It was that the same process, just showing it around and asking people what they thought and this, you know, this sense of continuous self-improvement and... It was finding people who were better than me. It was acknowledging that I didn't know what I was doing. And I would constantly reach out to people who I wanted to emulate, people who had a career that I wanted to have. And I would continually reach out to them. They would go, oh, okay, you're looking at doing this. Well, if you want to do that, do ABC and then do DEF. And once again, this, this is something that's true across the board. Whatever you want to do, whatever you want to be, I've learned that people who are the best at what they're doing, they all know one thing. They know that there is more room for successful people than there will ever be successful people to fill those slots. So when you reach, when you reach out to those people and you say, I want to learn how to get to this level, more times than not, they're going to tell you. If you're willing to listen, I've had many times where a person would come up to me and go, hey, I want to do what you did. I want to go into this market. And I say, well, all right, do ABC. Oh, well, no, I'm going to do MZ and then and then Y. Well, OK, but what would you do after ABC? Well, after ABC, I did DEF. Yeah, well, I'm going to do P blue square. <laughs> Good luck. You know. All the best to you. It, it, it's when you don't, when you want to tell somebody what you want to do and you're looking for validation for what you're saying, you're not learning and it's, and you're not growing. It's the easy way. It's the yeah. Easy way. Yeah. I mean, you, you wrote in the book, never become comfortable. It kills, kills your drive. And it, you know, it reminds me of, um, I remember a couple of people in film in New York city and one of them had extremely low rent. And mm -hmm. the girl that he was seeing at the time, it was his ex-girlfriend, was saying that that's a bad thing to have really low rent because you don't have to work as hard. You know, I uh, I don't agree with what somebody told me once. Somebody once told me that you should lease a Lamborghini because then you're going to have to make enough money to afford that Lamborghini. Not that it quite work out that way. I, I don't. I, I don't think that's your best business plan um what i do think though is when you're doing something that you love so he had really cheap rent and i'm sure he wasn't making much and i'm sure he would have been happier in a higher rent place except when you're happy doing what you're doing you'll always make enough to get by when you're unhappy doing what you're doing, you're going to spend so much money trying not to be miserable that you're going to throw yourself into debt. 
most people I know who are who are doing something they're passionate about. It may take a while for the financial reward to come in. But if you don't need that immediate financial reward, the emotional reward, the spiritual reward, the reward of doing what you're passionate about says, yeah, that one, that, that little studio apartment in the middle of nowhere is perfect because I'm doing what I love. And, and talking about, you know, talking about your, your show and, and, you know, your whole spirit behind it of, you know, this, this uplifting and uh, not humiliating, maybe you could talk a little bit about the show and, and just like the tenor that you try to set and, you know, what the vibe is. And So Hypnosis Unleashed is Tuesday through Saturday at the Four Queens. We're on Fremont Street, downtown Vegas or in old Vegas. And feel free to check out hypnosisunleashed.com. But the show is... One of my my very good friends and somebody and somebody who helps me write described it as a hypnosis party because people have the ability to volunteer, but even the audience, I want them as part of the show. Like this is it's 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 a comedy event. I want everybody to walk out of there having had fun, having laughed, and having gone, "Wow, you can really do some amazing stuff with that." And hopefully it inspires many nights. I'm talking to people after the show about how they can use hypnosis to improve their day to day life. Right, right. And I, and I want to definitely get get into self hypnosis in a bit. But if you could just talk about the, I guess how the show works. And you know, you've said the act of wanting yep. to be hypnotized allows you to be hypnotized. Like that's that's a big part of it. So, so what happens in the show is, and I'm very fortunate. I get to work with my wife. She's my onstage assistant. She's also at hypnosis training. So she does a couple of her own things in the show as well. The beautiful but assistant, it, Emily. Yes. And it, right. it's fantastic that I, I get to, to live my dream with my wife. And what happens is I'll come out. I'll spend about 10 minutes jokingly, you know, jokingly and in, in, in a comedic way, talking about what hypnosis is and what it isn't. So you have a, a better understanding about what you're getting into because a lot of people, it's like, come up and I'll hypnotize you. Well, I don't know what that means. Oh, well, let me give you some examples. Let me share with you what hypnosis is. And one of my goals, I do everything I can to demystify the idea of hypnosis. I want you to understand it's something you've done. It's something you've experienced in your life multiple times a week. And the more you understand it, the more I can make you relate to it, the more you go, oh, well, if that's what it is, I'd love to give it a chance. And then I get my volunteers and I just explain how I'm going to keep you safe up here. And then in about four and a half minutes, I usually have about half of them right in that state of hypnotic focus. And off we go. And I saw um you know, do you choose volunteers based on people who you think, you know, if you got the, the guy in the security guard post, <laughs> his arms crossed and yeah, it, a little frigid, my sense is you wouldn't choose that. Yeah. So person. I, so my first rule is I don't choose my volunteers. Wow. If I, if I were to forcibly drag you on stage, if you don't want to relax, you're not going to relax. I, I can't force you to listen to me. I can't force you to do the things that I request that you do to get yourself into that state of hypnotic focus. So you have to want to do it. And I make it very clear right off the bat, you know, one of the people I don't want on stage is I don't want someone on stage who wants to prove they can't be hypnotized. You win. You know, I'm not there to take a challenge. I'm here to do something fun. And if you don't want to volunteer, you don't have to volunteer. Stay down there in the audience, laugh, have fun, watch, enjoy yourself. But these people want to volunteer, so let's have them come up. I've seen clips of Terry Stokes show he brings on, I don't know, let's say a dozen people, walk through the hypnotic induction. There might be two or three folks that it just doesn't take, and he you know, politely ushers them off the stage. Is that sort of the setup that you have in your show? or That's, that's pretty much standard for most hypnosis shows. Okay. And the reason for that – now, this is where hypnosis gets a little confusing. Understand that. When I have 12 volunteers on stage, if I took four and a half minutes with each one of those 12, I'd get all 12 of them under. But that's an hour gone. <laughs> I describe the difference between therapeutic hypnosis and 
what I do for comedy hypnosis. It's the difference between a sniper rifle and a sawed off shotgun. One on one, I can learn from you what makes you comfortable, what helps get you where you need to be. And I can take you on that tailored journey. On stage, I have to grab a sawed off shotgun and hit as many as I can as quick as I can. I've got about four and a half minutes to get enough of my volunteers there so that we can have a fun show. Otherwise, the audience is going to get bored and restless. So I have to balance out how long do I want this induction to go with how entertaining can I make that induction for the audience while still making it effective for the volunteers. So yeah. there, there's a, a little balancing act in that part of it. So can you describe the process of hypnosis? I guess there's an induction, there's a there's a, a focus point. How, how does it work? So there's thousands of different points of views, and there are thousands of different ways of getting you there. Let's break it down to the simplest thing. You have passed through the state of hypnosis every night before you fall asleep, and you've passed through it again every morning as you're waking up. You've had that moment of hypnosis when you're vividly daydreaming and you don't hear anything going on around you. You've had that moment of hypnosis when you're driving, it's late at night and you're driving back in your neighborhood and did you stop for that stop sign? Okay. You were focused on the road. You were completely focused. We don't really remember that last mile. That's your subconscious taking over. So in, a, in bringing into somebody into that hypnotic focus, what you're doing is you are taking them to a point where their mind is focused on one other concept or idea and their subconscious coming to the forefront. Your conscious mind never shuts off. Let's say you came to a hypnotist because you wanted to quit smoking and the hypnotist tells you, all right, on the count of three, you're going to dance like Britney Spears. You would just wake up. Your conscious mind never shuts off. What happens, though, is when you volunteer for a comedy show, consciously you've said, I know he's going to tell me to do some silly things. If I make sure that I don't do anything that puts you into a difficult situation, then those comedy things will make sense in that moment. So all you're doing to simplify it is I'm relaxing the conscious mind while letting the subconscious come to the forefront and do what it wants to do. Conscious mind and the subconscious mind. So, so you can if you if you're able to hypnotize somebody, you can't get them to do something that they wouldn't want to do. Ooh, you? now that is my favorite lie in all of hypnosis. My favorite lie in all of hypnosis is you wouldn't do something you wouldn't normally do. So right now we've been talking for about a half an hour, which is way longer than I'll talk to anybody who I'm going to hypnotize in the show. Could you name five things you're positive I wouldn't do? No. So first of all, what would or wouldn't a person do? And then to change that around, in any given situation, what would or wouldn't a person do? One of my jobs is to keep people safe, to make sure they're not falling out of chairs, to make sure they're not doing anything that can hurt themselves, but also to make sure that I'm never creating a situation or a scenario in their mind where they're going to be uncomfortable or it's going to recall a trauma. I have to make sure that I'm keeping all of my situations appropriate to your safety and your well-being. And so how about if you knew somebody really well? Could you get them to do something nefarious? Once again, once again, probably not. Wow. Um, also because... When you know somebody really well, that they, they, they may not trust you enough to let you hypnotize them, especially when you use your powers for evil instead of good like I do. Right. Um, rarely will a friend volunteer for my show because when a stranger volunteers, I have duty of care. When a friend volunteers, I'm going to do whatever. I want. <laughs> and they know that because, uh, you know, your friends, you don't trust them. <laughs> not, not, not with that. <laughs> Well, I, I often, in getting back to Don Rickles, I'm often reminded of the quote, you don't, you only make fun of people that you like. So. Exactly. <laughs> yep. 
So, so Je- Jeff Ross is the same. You only roast the ones you love. There you go. Um, so, you know, we, we, you know, there are various stages. There's self hypnosis. You've talked about, you know, hypnotherapy. How does that differ? And, and I guess that you, you touched upon it. It's kind of the one-on-one versus the, the shotgun approach where you're doing an audience, but what, what more in, is there to it? And you were trained by it. A hypnotherapist. Yes, I I was trained by a hypnotherapist, social worker. I wanted to I, at the time. I mean, when I learned, we're talking like the the mid nineties. There was no internet. There was no global community that you had immediate access to. So I I had to learn from doctors, but I wanted to learn from doctors because that meant I was learning to do it safely, and that was always my big thing. Is I wanted it to be safe. Now, when people want like a very common thing with with hypnosis is changing a habit or getting rid of a phobia. One of the best ways that I can describe how the brain works is on the count of three, whatever you do, do not think of a pink elephant. One, two, three. Pink elephant. You almost have no choice. Yeah, it just <laughs> pops right in there. Thousands of them. <laughs> yep. On the other hand, if I say on the count of three, think of something you like more than elephants. One, two, three. You can think of a thousand things. With hypnosis, one of the ways that I describe it is hypnosis creates a beautiful pattern interrupt. I'm not telling you not to think of something because as soon as I tell you don't think of this, it's the only thing you can think of. On the other hand, if I tell you when you find yourself thinking about that, I want you to think of these things instead. And to be honest, the first time you try it, it might work for five seconds. But then after you try it a few times, it works for 10 and then 15 and then 30 and then a minute and then five minutes. And slowly but surely, what you do is you build a bridge over one habit of thinking for a habit of thinking you would rather have. And so how many sessions would it take, let's say, to lose weight or to stop smoking? Depend, depends on the person. Yeah. I I have known of miracles with one session. I've known people who have gone... 12 times before they really hit upon where they needed to be. Talk about, you know, what, what's interesting is that, and I, I, I've noticed the start of the hypnosis is almost exactly like the beginning of meditation. You know, yes. Your body. And are so, they similar? so if you meditate, one of the best ways I can explain it is when you meditate, you kind of zone out to the, to the universe. You yeah. just kind of completely zone out. It's that same feeling. But instead of being zoned out to everything, you're laser focused on one idea or goal. And so talk about um, regression hypnotherapy. And, and that's something that you don't like to do. Uh, but but how is that different? And, and how does how does that work? So regression is very misunderstood, uh, as is memory. Both with regression and memory recall. You really want to work with somebody who is very, 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 very trained in those particular aspects because memory is so malleable. It is so easy to influence and change somebody's memory about a situation that, I mean, that that's why if there are witnesses to a case in court, the witnesses are not allowed in a room together and they're not allowed to talk about what they saw with each other because if a blue car was responsible for this and two years later, all the witnesses in the room are talking and one of the witnesses talks about the yellow car, the other witnesses will start remembering the yellow car instead of the blue one. Your memory can be that malleable. And then with regression, it's the same thing. There's a big difference between asking somebody to go back to a certain time period in their life and asking a person now tell me about the time you were beaten because if the person had never been beaten and you're pushing them for an answer they're going to strive to give you an answer and that's where it gets complicated now people who are very professional at regression they know how to take somebody back to what's called a sensitizing moment that's what regression is used for is to take you to that moment where something happened that caused you to have distress from that point on. But sometimes our conscious mind blocks that sensitizing moment out of protection. And you have to, 
almost the best way that I can explain it is it's like you're unfolding a rose, not shattering a, a glass. So I've had a couple of guests on the show who, you know, U- UFOs and, and UFO ufologists and, you know, within that community, there's mm-hmm. the abduction phenomenon. And yep. know, much of that is through hypnotic regression, setting aside the idea of yep. you know, alien abductions. Is that conceivable that if it were to be the case that these people were abducted, that it could be properly unfolded like a rose through hypnotherapy or are you a skeptic in that sense you know uh, people ask me the same thing about past life regression and here's what i will say about that is if you believe that ufos are real then nothing i'm going to say is going to change your mind if you don't believe they're real nothing i'm going to say is going to change your mind um, somebody once, I, I, I believe somebody said this about professional wrestling, but it was probably about something else. The line was, um, if you get it, then no explanation is necessary. And if you don't get it, no explanation will do. And, and I'm sure that wasn't about wrestling. It had to have been about something and the wrestling world took that. Um, but let's, let, let's break it down into two scenarios. Scenario one is there's there's UFOs. There's real, they're real. Somebody was regressed and they remembered exactly what happened. Scenario two, there's no such thing as UFOs. Well, then this person was still regressed to a moment where something very important happened to them. And that moment really needs to be worked out with doctors. In either one of those two things, if they're really, if they really were abducted, then I promise you they probably need some help. And if they weren't actually abducted, I promise you they need some help. And in terms of help, I mean, let's get into the concept of self-help. And, and so, like, yes, what's self-hypnosis? I mean, is it doable? How does that work? Most versions of hypnosis are self-hypnosis. I can't force you to be hypnotized. This goes what we're, goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning. I can't force you to want to do it. As a hypnotist, more times than not, I'm a tour guide. I take you on a journey into your own mind. But you have to want to walk that path as well. And so as, you're, as I'm walking you down that path, you're allowing yourself to do this. Most of what I do, you can do with yourself. You just have to understand the goals you're trying to set for yourself. And sometimes we need somebody else to help us set those goals because obviously we're trying to change a behavior and talking with somebody who has experience helping people change those behaviors is a much more solid way to go. Okay. So you're saying you're an advocate for seeing a hypnotist, hypnotherapist, rather than trying to do it on your own. I am actually more of an advocate for go and see a therapist and if they feel that hypnosis will help you they'll recommend you to somebody who's very good at it fair enough fair enough um and then how about street hypnosis i mean i've seen a couple of these things where you know it's almost like impromptu within a matter of seconds so you're rolling your eyes Uh, i am rolling my eyes hard (laughs) um the reason i'm rolling my eyes hard at that is I wish one of these people, just one, would be would release an unedited hour-long video so that you could see all the times it didn't work and all the people who didn't want to pay attention. If I'm showing you three minutes out of an hour, you're going to see a really great three minutes but you're not going to see what the hour that it took to get to those three minutes. So there's a lot of averages they've done into 50, a hundred people and they, you know, take the. No. um, It's a little bit different than that. Street performing is hard. Yeah. Real street performing is hard. You're trying to make your living work in the street. That is very hard, which also a lot of these people aren't, they're just trying to, you know, they're just trying to, film something so they're not passing a hat and they're teaching people you don't need to pay street performers which is completely wrong um but 
what I'm saying is it's not just, oh, well, it didn't work for this person. It didn't work for this person. No, I mean, it took 20 minutes to just get a crowd of people around you to start trying. You know, there, there's a lot more that goes into it. I, I always remember anything you see online is a commercial. And nobody's going to put out a bad commercial for their product. They're going to show you what they want you to believe happens each and every time. And commercials are 60 seconds and they take hours and hours to shoot. <laughs> any any given 30-second commercial probably took a week to shoot if it's on television. Yeah, exactly. Well, and, yeah. and then it probably took almost 60 hours to edit <laughs> right, right. um you talked about street performers and you know for for people listening please throw some money in the hat whenever you're oh you're, god you know, there are so many great street always, performers i know always. um in fact the amazing jonathan started as a street performer really and he started as a street performer learning at the feet of another amazing uh magician who was a street performer by the name of harry the hat okay also known as Harry Anderson. Nice. Yep, from, from the original show Night Court and from Cheers. <laughs> Harry started as, as a street performer. Jonathan learned from him. I was very fortunate when I moved to New Orleans. I, I got to know Harry. Um, I wish I'd have been a little bit more mature. I wish I would have had a little bit more depth of understanding. And I, I really would have been able to learn even more from him than I had. And then when I moved to Vegas, Jonathan became one of my dearest friends. I mean, he uh, he was a groomsman in my wedding, and I was a groomsman in his. And, I mean, those guys, you know, they went from the street to huge showrooms to television. And, and I mean, it's it's an amazing art form when you can stop a group of 30 or 40 people who are on their way to do something else. And you were able to say, no, 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 no. Watch my silly little, little stupid thing before you go do what you were supposed to do. And then they give you money for that experience. That's awesome. That is a skill. I know some street performers in New Orleans still who their crowd psychology is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And how, how, do, how do they do it? What's the psychology? How do they, how do they you know, round up a, a group? So, I wanted to book uh, one of these street performers for a lecture once. And he said, I, I can't do it. Everybody will hate my lecture. I'm like, no, you're, you're one of the best. They'll love you. He said, no, here's my lecture. Ready? Go out six hours a day. Do six shows an hour, six hours a day, six days a week for six months. After six months, you'll probably suck less. <laughs> After a year, you should know if you want to do it. And within two years, you might be decent at it if you listen to your audience. And, and that's the truth of it, is the only way you ever get good on the street is you got to go out there and get your teeth kicked in. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a hard skill. But for the ones I know who have mastered it, and, you know, you, you were asking, well, you know, so, so how does their psychology work? I can take two performers who have completely different audience psychology and call them both masters at their craft. And they'll both whip out a crowd of 50 when you would swear there was nobody on the street and people are throwing them tens, twenties, fifties, and hundreds. Wow. Because they, it's also a lot, a lot of what makes a great performer, a great performer is when it's based in who you really are. When you, we, it, audiences know if you're not being sincere. Audiences know if you're lying to them. You can be a magician and, you know, you can say all of magic's a trick and therefore a trick's a lie. But you can still do it sincerely. You can do it with a smile and you can do it with an emotion and you can do it with joy. And you can do it in a way that just makes people go, wow, I loved that moment. And if you're sincere, you can do that. If you're insincere, the audience will push you away every time. And what do 
mean by being insincere versus sincere? You know it when you see it. You know it when you've seen a comedian and they weren't getting laughs. Like maybe the material was funny, but they weren't really getting laughs. And it's just you, you didn't believe the performer who was telling those jokes that night. You've you've seen it in you've seen it when you've seen a bad play, when you've seen an actor in a movie, and you go, God, they just look like they were there to get the paycheck. You know, and when you're watching a good movie, you suspend your disbelief. Um, once again, to go back to pro wrestling, most of pro wrestling is ludicrous. But every once in a while, there's a wrestler, a performer, who can work with another performer in that ring, and they will tell a story. They will honestly do a nonverbal play. And for just one second, it's not that you'll suspend your disbelief. It's that for one second, you will want to believe and you will believe because there's a sincerity there in what they're doing. The street performers, you know, that's that's tough. And I mean, I imagine if you cut your teeth as a street performer, it's a lot easier. It almost becomes easy when you go into a you know a stage situation. Not always. Not always, but you've got always drunk because lorette parties and all that. True, but the majority of the skill of a street performer is to belly up a crowd. Ah. The goal of the stage performer is I have to entertain these people who are here. And they've paid for it. Yes. As a street performer, the skill is building the crowd and then building, taking that crowd and doing one or two things that make them want to throw you money. For me, I've done all the marketing work. You've bought your ticket to my show. You've given the money. Now I owe you uh -huh. an hour and 15 minutes of entertainment throughout. So there is no build. <laughs> the build's there. They're already there. Right. Now I have to provide them quality entertainment for that time span. And so how do you deal with people who uh, detract from the entertainment? The, the the people who lost 10 grand at the table, the, the you know, the drunks. It's, the it's hard. It's hard because you never know why. Some people are just obnoxious some people are just drunk some people are in a bad mood as a performer you have to set certain boundaries certain performers invite heckling i once asked somebody who i was touring with for a while when i was you know doing some different stuff i said i get heckled why don't you he said you invited i don't and i had to look through there and go so where am i inviting this and then I had to change that because that's not what I want. And so in what ways were you inviting heckling? Um, if you are throwing out random questions to the audience, Fair enough. you're asking for a response. Right. If you are giving the audience information that they're reacting to, that's different. But if I'm directly asking people questions, then somebody's going to shout out an answer because they think they're helping. Most hecklers think they're helping they think that's what the performer wants and as soon as you take that out of it the rest is easy and you've talked about your show i mean it's again we get back to this theme of you know continuous improvement and you watch your yeah. shows and you know and, and i have and... people i respect come in and direct me i have people i respect come in and help me write I, I i'm constantly working with people who i think are better than me in certain areas to help me improve in those areas and so are you still 13 and a half years into it, improving parts of the show? And Yes. Oh, God, yes. In fact, uh, Mike Hammer, comedy magician, he's at the Four Queens, 7 p.m. He does an amazing show. And Mike has no reason to stick around for mine, but he does. And he gives me notes and he gives me ideas. Hell, we were for about two hours, a few days ago, for about two hours, we were going over three sentences in my show and figuring out how to tighten those three sentences because he called me up and he went, that joke's hilarious. It's not getting the laugh that you get. 
and we just cut it and cut it and cut it and cut it until we figured out there's the core. Now do that on stage. And, and we'll do that over two or three sentences to get a joke right. There was that, that famous Mark, Mark Twain quote, I would have written a shorter letter, but I didn't have time. Yep, exactly. And it's the best editing is deleting and brevity is. Yes, it's uh, and there, and yet not to throw out all these quotes, but Stephen yeah. King, "Kill Your Darlings," was his. Yep. Well, it was attributed to him, and it's and it's so so true. And 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 what that and what that meant for those of you who aren't familiar, when Stephen King said, "As a writer, you have to kill your darlings," what he meant was, you may have written this great character, you may have written this great scenario, but it's not great for this book you're writing now. You got to kill it from that. Come back to that idea. Maybe you'll have an idea for that character, that situation. But all you're doing right now is wasting pages on it. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut had my favorite line as an author. Don't waste your audience's time and don't use semicolons. It makes you look pretentious. <laughs> yes. I do not use semicolons. <laughs> what, what do you say? It only makes you people know that you went to college. <laughs> mm -hmm. Put in a period. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I, 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 but that was one of my favorite lines from Kurt Vonnegut was don't waste your audience's time. Um, so, you know, you've talked about critiquing not to take it to heart and, yeah. you know, just, just yeah, I, again, just getting back to where we started and just, you know, you know, the themes we were talking about before we, we jumped on the show is just one finding community and seeking, seeking help when you need it. You talk a little bit about that and, um, for folks, you know, there's, there's communities out there. There really are. Sometimes you need to expand. Sometimes you need to find communities. Here's one of the. So the negative about the internet is it's easy to find a negative community. But the joy of the internet is that there are people in your hometown who love the things that you love. There, there's people within 100 miles of you who want to participate in the things you want to participate in. And, and there's a chance to reach out and grow. And I, I tell everybody, reach out to people. If, if there's something you want to do and something you want to accomplish – Reach out to people who are doing it. You'd be surprised at how many people will gladly respond positively if you're not wasting their time and you're willing to listen to what they have to say. 100%. 100%. And, and yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, do I mean, that's the whole thing of this, you know, podcast is reaching out to people. And, you know, not everybody's going to respond, but you can't mm -hmm. take it personally. And, I mean, that's something that you've said that you've, you don't know, take critique to heart it's it's about the show it's about the so show. i've actually gotten into an argument with some people about this lately <laughs> um i firmly believe that all unsolicited advice is criticism if i didn't ask you for your input you have no reason to give it to me that's fair um and the argument came from some friends of mine and i went well wait a minute you're talking about this on a you and me basis. See, you and me, we have a history. We have a long history. I know where your critiques are coming from. I know where your input's coming from. I want your input. I want your critiques. But if I don't know somebody and I haven't asked them for their opinion, I probably don't want it. <laughs> and because until I know where your opinion is coming from, I don't know how to value it. You're offering me your advice from your life experience, but I don't know your life experience to know whether this is something I want to take the time to, to explore. Now, if I get to know you and we have that relationship, yes, but especially online and, and in day-to-day -day life, if I don't know someone, and I'm not direct, directly asked for advice. I don't give it. Fair enough. Yeah, it, it, that lesson took me a while to learn. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a hard one because you want to help somebody. But also, when you're giving that unsolicited advice, is it happening in a moment where somebody can actually absorb it? That's very true. And there are times that you could be saying something very, 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 very helpful. 
but there's something else going on internally with the receiver that's not going to allow them to receive that in a positive way. Yeah. So for somebody that wants to do what you do and be a, a performer for a living, do you have to move to Vegas? I mean, there's no, Netherlands, there's no, Europe, there's LA. There's your hometown. If you want to, it depends what you mean by performer. If you want to be an actor, if you want to be a professional actor, Odds are you're going to have to go to Chicago, L.A., New York, unless there's a film community in your hometown area. On the other hand, if you want to be a performer, you can start in your hometown. You want to be a stand-up, there's a club in your area. Go hit open mic nights. You want to learn to do magic, there's a magic community. You want to learn to be a writer, there's a writing community. I... I don't like the, you know, big fish in a small pond, small fish in a big pond scenario. Right. What I'm saying is before you chase something, take what's in front of you. It's easier to learn from what's in front of you before you spend all the money, time, and energy to move somewhere else. There's no sense in going to college if you haven't graduated elementary school. So, so you're saying wherever your community is, whatever state you are in the country, in the world. Get learn, started there. Yeah, learn your trade. and Yep. And, and once you've found that you are, that you can't do more than you're already doing in that hometown community, then it's time to decide if you want to grow to a different community. Yeah. So, so what's, what's next for you? I just get to live my dream. You know, I, I get to wake up every morning in my bed. I get to, at night, go with my wife and do the show I always dreamed about doing in the venue I always dreamed about doing it in. And then every once in a while, I get inspired and I do something else. Like, you know, I got inspired to do the book when I saw the picture that I used for the cover that I, I bought the rights for. And the cover of it, it's behind me. The cover is a bunch of fish teamed up to look like a shark to chase a shark away. Because wow. that was my story. That was build a community, chase the sharks away. And, you know, sometimes I teach classes because that's okay. fun for me. And you just, when, whenever I get inspired to do something, my question is, am I inspired to do this in a way that will bring something positive? And if so, my wife and I do. I've been helping her actually. She's been building a children's show um, mm -hmm. talking about um, dealing with negative self-talk and emotional growth and emotional learning for elementary schools. Wonderful. Yeah, it's fantastic. Wonderful. Well, um, Kevin, thank you for joining us. And, and tell My us, greatest pleasure. Yes. Tell us more about the, the show and, and how folks yep. can see it and how folks can find out more about you. So if you're interested in the book, Deep Into My Eyes, From Victim to Vegas Headliner is available at deepintomyeyes.com. And Hypnosis Unleashed plays five nights a week at the Four Queens. Go to hypnosisunleashed.com and get your tickets. Come and join us in Vegas. All right. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for being on the show. My pleasure, Mark. Thank you. Thank you.